What's going on, everybody, and welcome to episode 122 of the Book Binge, where just like when I covered that book right back there last week, uh, I'm covering another book that had a pretty mixed reception amongst people, generally speaking, but most specifically amongst my friends, where there are ratings ranging all the way from the top at 5 out of 5 down to the bottom at 1 out of 5. So uh, this is The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. And if you wanted a little bit more of a basic coverage on this, I did talk about this book uh, in my Stephen Graham Jones special that I did for episode, oh, what was it? Was it, uh, that was episode 114, where I covered uh, four different Stephen Graham Jones books. Uh, this time I'm doing a dedicated review. It's kind of similar to what I did last year, where I did my spooky season wrap up talking about Haunting of Hill House, uh, Rebecca and American Psycho, and then I did a dedicated or dedicated review on American Psycho later, even though I didn't do one for the other two because I didn't feel like I needed to, and I said basically all I wanted to on those ones. This one I'm doing a dedicated review on because even though I did talk about it in that video, episode 114, just as I mentioned, I had a little bit more that I wanted to say about it than what I said there. I don't really have much more to say at the beginning of this, so I'm just going to jump right into the good of the only good Indians. Uh, there's going to be a decent bit here, actually. If you watched that other video and you got my basic coverage or you read my written review, which was surprisingly in-depth, you know that I liked this book more than I disliked it. So there is going to be a little bit more here. Uh, but keep in mind, a lot of this stuff is going to be in a sort of context with uh, Stephen Graham Jones's or SGJ's other stories that I've read, those being Night of the Mannequins, Flush Boy, and Mapping the Interior. So there is a little bit of context specifically related to the author rather than in comparison to everything that I've read, generally speaking. But without further ado, I'm just going to talk about the things that I did enjoy, those being... First off, the character work being surprisingly good. I had heard the way that a couple other people talked about this book. They said that the characters were not good, that they were very flat and disinteresting and made them, you know, want to gouge out their eyes, essentially. And uh, I did not find that to be a problem in The Only Good Indians. In fact, I thought that the characters here were much more in-depth than any of the characters in the other Stephen Graham Jones stories. Uh, a lot of that is due to the fact that the other three stories are very short in comparison to this one. And so these ones having a little bit more to them and in their sort of like internal monologuing as POV characters or even in their conversations are bringing up characters and moments from their past and other stuff like this that actually made me care about the characters just entirely. And that I wasn't quite expecting, but it was a really nice feeling. I was actually invested with nearly every character here, especially in the first two parts of the story. Even though the f story itself, and speaking of the story, I would say that the plot of The Only Good Indians felt a little bit deeper than the other SGJ novels that I read, uh, since this was a full novel rather than a 100-page novella like Night of the Mannequins and Mapping the Interior were, or even a short 200-page uh I would say a novella, I guess, but I guess it could also be a novel. Either way, Flush Boy was only 200 pages. The other two books were only 100. This one took a little bit more time to develop some things fairly decently in ways that the others didn't. So that was just kind of like a stark contrast that I gravitated towards liking more in this story. The absurd violence in this story also felt a little bit more personal. This comes into play a much more much more particularly in the climax of part two, which I thought was great. A uh, parts one climax was uh, mostly unexpected and slightly unbelievable, but generally speaking, I thought that the violence of the story was a little bit more uh, interesting, a lot more, like I said, personal than the other stories were. Night of the Mannequins uh, had a narrator, had a protagonist, if you could call him a protagonist, that when violence happened in that story it didn't feel like believable to like a person like me like i tend to put myself into the character whatever the main character of a story is whether male or female or whatever other aspects there are to them uh, i tend to become that character in at least some sense with night of the mannequins that was a little bit more 
strange because it was like, I don't actually feel this way. I'm not actually this crazy person. Uh, I connected a little bit more with these protagonists for that reason, where, you know, violence specifically was concerned. The implied history of characters is something that I just sort of hinted at a second ago. The implied history of these characters and their interactions with each other are pretty good uh, and surprisingly in-depth and really kind of make you believe that there's a history to them. I know a lot of that sentence probably seemed rather redundant, but that's basically the way that I feel. The prologue of the story was pretty good, uh, and then the stories told in Lewis's POV in part one made me care about care about him and his acquaintances and the friends of his past, which in some sense at least a little bit hinged around or at least referenced stuff from the prologue, so a lot of this just kind of revolved in on itself and just felt really nice to read. Uh, the stories told from the friends' POVs, specifically in part two, also made me care about their various relationships a little bit more in depth as well. So like I said, there you can tell there's a history with these characters and that dictates the way that they interact with each other in the story. I thought that the character work was overall just pretty good. And moving tracks into a little bit of a different aspect, uh, I quite liked all of the basketball stuff in the first two parts of the story as well. And I say the first two parts for a very specific reason. We'll talk a little bit more on that later. Um, also, in regards to part three, which is pretty much the only part that I haven't really talked about in the good, uh, the resolution was surprisingly satisfying because of how full circle it was. Uh, but again, we'll probably talk a little bit more on that a bit later. The bad of the only good Indians pretty much just comes down to the counterpoint that I made to those last two points in the good. Uh, the basketball scene that people complain about in the climax of the book, basically starting off part three of the novel, is admittedly a bit over the top and kind of strange and also a little bit underwhelming in some ways. It's ironic that it's both underwhelming and over the top. Uh, and the chase to follow it was pretty meh as well, so these were a couple aspects to uh, the climax of the book that I just didn't really love. Part 3 as a whole was pretty meh, even if the resolution itself is pretty good in spite of it, kind of like I mentioned. Uh, but the only other thing that I'll specifically include in the bad here is that the end of part 1 was pretty unexpected. I kind of brought this up a little bit with the violence of it, but there was a couple aspects of the story where it just took turns that was like... Hmm, that, that was kind of a weird decision, and that's that's where I'll leave that, because this last point is where I move into the ugly, that being, obviously, SGJ is Native American, but from what I can tell, the specific creature and the folkloresque tale that is used as basically the basis for the Only Good Indians as a story, I isn't actually based on something and that's a really weird decision uh it seems like it takes some inspiration from a thing or two but isn't itself a common native american folkloric creature like say the wendigo is uh, for certain tribes or regions uh, as such this creature and various aspects to the book relating to it feel overly absurd and a little bit strange and where people's people have complaints regarding the antagonist of the book i am completely sympathetic to them because i think they're probably the worst broad scale part of the book even if this aspect is a lot of why the resolution feels satisfying in full circle it's this kind of this weird dichotomy that i felt like i had with the story also, because the creature isn't based in something to research or something that someone might already have knowledge in, the rules do seem kind of arbitrary as well, which is a little bit unfortunate. I just kind of wish that this was like, you know, for example, a Wendigo, where there's some sort of rules or some sort of set of folkloric tales where we could base our knowledge of the creature on and therefore set parameters for certain things that could or would happen in the story unfortunately that isn't a thing here so like i said those rules seem arbitrary either way as for the recommendation overall i totally get the mixed reception to the only good indians i absolutely see why some people dislike it uh, even if i don't necessarily get the aggressive hatred and ire that some people have for it but i can't really say i recommend the book either per se 
Uh, I did enjoy it a decent bit, especially the first two parts of it, but I do feel like most people I know are pretty mixed to negative on the story, with a few being mixed to positive as well, but generally speaking, I feel like that balance is a little bit lower, and I think a lot of this is because, like, the basketball scene, some of the more absurd elements, uh, probably the folkloric element that say i take the biggest issue with but it this is a story that's like if you want to give it a shot go ahead and do so i uh, don't if you don't really feel interested in it or if if you don't like basketball maybe don't read this book actually because there's a little bit more basketball than i think a non-basketball fan would enjoy reading about uh but this is one of those instances of my not giving you a recommendation one way or the other it's kind of similar to the road that one was like if you want to read it just read it if you don't don't. I'm not going to urge you to. This is one I'm not going to urge you to read, but I'm not going to urge you to skip it either. So that's basically where I fall. I know I'm being a fence sitter here, but it's this is one of those special books that like you can't really give it a broad scale recommendation or non recommendation. I feel like uh, because if I listened to all the people who were like this book is really stupid, I wouldn't have read the book and you know enjoyed it because I did overall enjoy it but if I listened to everybody was like this book is really good then maybe I would have been a lot more disappointed than I was going into it with that mixed reception in mind uh kind of helped my personal perception of it a bit um but yeah that will be the end of this review next month January I'm doing my end of year wrap up and a lot of other fun stuff in that regard not entirely sure if there will be any reviews but it's, it's mostly just insane that that already happens here in just a couple of weeks. Actually, what day does this review come out on? This comes out on the 26th, so like next week is January. Yeah, like n next week is uh, when we start doing all of that wrap-up stuff, and that's really crazy to me. It feels like it was just a few months ago that I did that for 2022, uh, so... Thanks for all of the incredible and huge support this year. I hope any and all of you who are interested in sticking around will stick around. I greatly appreciate all the support, and I'll see you guys in the next video, whatever it is.